Psalm 118 reminds us that today is the day the Lord has made. Rejoice and be glad in it. Something that I've been thinking through this week is the idea of adoration. And that's what we as a church are doing this morning as we come to a time of worship. We are coming in adoration worship. We adore our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. We want Him to know how much we love Him. We want to show Him our deep love and yearning for Him. Church, I encourage you this morning to do whatever's required, to focus your eyes, your mind, your heart, your spirits this morning in a, to come to a place of adoration this morning. Let's worship together. Psalm 108. That the highest king 
would welcome me. I was lost, but you brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free. Oh, it's free. our service today, he talked about encountering God and drawing close to Him and opening our hearts to Him. And we've got an opportunity now to do that even more. When God draws near to us, He gives us His peace. We receive His love afresh into our hearts as we open them up to Him. And so His invitation to all of us this morning is to dwell in His presence, to abide with Him and to be close to Him and receive what He has for us today. And we thank You, God, for that, that You make all things good and it is well with us, God.
God, we just carve out some time now, Father, to meet with you. God, as we come to church today, it's all about meeting with you. It's all about hearing from you, God. So, Lord, come into the place we are now. Would you come, Lord? We focus all we are on you. God, you call yourself the God of all comfort. Father, where we need comfort, we receive that from you today. You're the God of all peace. You're the God of all strength. You're the God of all power. The God of all that we would need. And so God, be with us today. You say to us to present our petitions and our requests to you, God. And as we do that, you will give us your peace. And so church, I want to... I want to ask and uh, encourage you to suggest to bring your petitions and your requests before God this morning. What is it that's burning in your heart today? What is it that's laying heavy on your heart today? Let's bring those to God and receive the peace He has for us. Let's speak to Him.
Amen, church. You know, the Apostle Paul says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, with prayer and petition and with thanksgiving, we are to make our requests known before God. You know, why is it that we can live with a great sense of peace in our lives? Well, Jesus tells us that He has overcome the world. He has everything uh, in His hands. Would you join me as I pray this morning? Heavenly Father, we worship and we adore You this morning. We thank You that as we gather in worship today, we, we lift Your name high. We honor You today. But Father, we thank You for the peace that You promised to give us. It's a peace that transcends all understanding that promises to guard our hearts and our minds because of Christ Jesus, because He has overcome, because He has it all in His hands. And so, Father, we, we honour You this morning. We bless You. We pray, Lord, into whatever situation that people uh, might be facing today, wherever they're listening or watching from, that, Father, as we give that situation to You, Father, we pray that uh, Your Spirit would move into that and You would give that very peace that You promised to give us today as we gather together in worship and we pray that today in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. Wherever you might be uh, watching, being online, or whether you're listening on Life 105.1 FM right here in Bendigo today, great to have you with us. And I trust that uh, this time has just been really encouraging to you as we've gathered together in worship once again as a church family. And that uh, over the next few minutes together that we spend, that this will be a great time for you, an enriching, encouraging, maybe even a challenging time where you sense the Spirit of God speaking into your own life as a follower of Jesus. Or maybe you're just tuning in today and this is your very first time. It's great to have you with us. And I trust that your experience of gathering with other people as we uh, gather as the church together for uh, this period truly enriches uh, your life and uh, it just uh, prompts and nudges you to keep exploring and to keep uh, uh, investigating who is this person called Jesus that we gather together in worship. You know, uh, there's so much that we're celebrating right here as a church family. In the past week, uh, there's a number of our mission partners, or we call them intercultural partners today, uh, who have... Uh some great things happening in their life uh, for Josh and Steph McKenzie and their family just graduated from uh, CMS and they're going to be returning to us just a few weeks time where they'll spend around six months before they head up to uh, the Northern Territory to be a part of uh, work there amongst the Indigenous people uh, right here in Australia. We've got Katrina Pemberton who's just wrapped up some of her studies and is spending the next 12 months in partner support so it's great to have her still here. And then uh, Dave and his son, Dave Thomas and his son Ardian uh, just flew in from Southeast Asia. They've been in quarantine for the past two weeks. They're out of that now and heading towards Melbourne. It's simply wonderful to have some of our partners that are so connected to this church, to have them amongst us. And uh, we look forward to uh, journeying with them over the next few weeks and months while they're around uh, as restrictions allow and uh, we get to be a part of their lives as well too. Now, there's a couple of things that I wanted to share with you today that are really significant in the life of our church that uh, if you've got a calendar, you may want to just pop this one into your calendar. But next Sunday, November the 29th, it's going to be a great day. And it's not just uh, involving our, our morning worship together, but it's going to be a great day of celebration right across the life of the church. But beginning uh, at 10.30 online with our worship, this is our family. We're going to be bookending our series called uh, Extraordinary. We've been focusing on the extraordinary work of God in the lives of ordinary people. And we've got some great stories to share. Uh, this is going to be a great time of worship. Our young people are going to be leading worship. We've got uh, some uh, significant awards that we're giving out to some people in the life of our church. There's going to be some testimonies. It's going to be a morning that you're not going to want to miss. So make sure that you are online at 10.30 for that. At 2 o'clock in the afternoon, uh, it's a little bit different this year, our annual celebration. Typically, we gather in the evening for uh, this, uh, this time together, but we're going to be doing our, our regular annual members meeting at 2 o'clock online together. Now, the link for that, that's going to be in your bulletins. It'll be on our uh, Facebook and on our social media this week as well, so anybody can get into that. But if you are a member of this church, so uh, if you've kind of gone through our membership process over the last few years, you know that you're a member. 
you want to uh, be a part of voting uh, in uh, the uh, online Zoom that we are doing in this members meeting, you need to register. You've got up until Friday this week to uh, go to our events page on our website and if you are a member, uh, put your name down there so we can send you out a unique uh, number that allows you to vote anonymously online. So I want to encourage you, everybody's welcome to that, but if you're a member, that's the way you've got to do it. You've got to do it right now and take care of that process. Then that night so there's still more to come then that night at six o'clock and we are hoping that restrictions are going to allow right here on our Juniton campus uh, we are hoping we can gather up to 500 people social distancing of course where we're going to have a great evening gathering together uh, so BYO picnic chair uh, drinks and uh, we're going to gather together on the front of our property out here and we're going to enjoy gathering as the church so our Eagle Hawk campus our Juniton campus our, our uh, community care hub right there in town we're going to gather here at six o'clock really want to encourage you to be there on that particular night but one other date sunday december the 13th you know this has been a year like no other i mean and for some people this has been incredibly challenging dealing with isolation separation and so many of us in our community have had to live with disappointment this year in in different ways well, as a church, uh, we decided that we would do Christmas a little bit different this year. And instead of doing our big carols on Christmas Eve, that we would actually bring it uh, earlier into uh, the Christmas season. And so on that night, we are doing a special online Christmas celebration event together because we want to be about uh, bringing joy and bringing togetherness and community right back here into the heart of Bendigo. You know, uh, in uh, December, typically thousands of people would gather right there in Rosie Park to do this, but they can't do it this year. And so uh, we want to actually foster that right here in this city. So how can you be a part of that? Well, it is an online event, but there's a number of different ways in which you can engage in this. First, and this is one way, uh, I want to encourage you, if restrictions are allowing us, to gather people in your home. Maybe it's your small group. Uh, maybe it's people from your neighborhood that you know have done it tough. Throw a barbecue in your house and invite them to be a part of this special online evening together. There's going to be uh, plenty of carol singing. There's going to be stories that are told. There's going to be games and activities. It's going to be truly unique, so you're not going to want to miss it. But uh, if you want something even a bit more significant, you want to be with uh, a greater number of people, it's our hope and it's what we're planning for that in each campus location uh, at Eagle Hawk and right here at Juniton, uh, that we will be gathering with all those that want to gather outside and we're going to be watching this on giant LED screens. So more details to come on that, but I want to encourage you to be a part of this. To, uh, to play your part as we gather together in community, cheering on and celebrating in the midst of this great Christmas season. You know, we've got a great God, and He's done great things right here in the lives of many people uh, throughout the Bendigo Baptist Church community. And for us this year, that just hasn't been people here in Bendigo. That's extended even much broader than this city. And so it's been a real privilege to have been a part of all of that. But we celebrate all that God has done. We celebrate His goodness. And right now, I want to just take an opportunity as we uh, pray into our, our offering. You know, many people are giving into the life of this church and what we do around this place. And, and I want to just say thank you for your generosity. Uh, you know what, when we gather together in worship, uh, we bring a gift, and sometimes that's already done online, but we gather and we bring a gift, and that's our way of saying back to God that we appreciate all of His goodness for what He's done in our lives. And everybody brings something a little bit different that, but uh, I want to encourage, if you're not a regular giver, you'll see uh, right there on the screen beside me the ways in which you can give into the life of our church. And I want to encourage you thinking prayerfully about, you know, what is it, what is it that gift that you are going to sacrificially give? You see, for one person, it's different to another person, but it's not about equal giving. It's about equal sacrifice. And so we bring something as a sacrificial act of worship to our great God. And so I want to pray now. I want to thank God for what He is doing. I want to pray for our offering. And then I also want to pray for Pastor Dave Gillett, who is our next-gen pastor, who's going to come and share with us this morning. So would you join me wherever you might be, on the radio or online? Let's pray together. I want to give you just a brief moment to thank God for maybe something in your own life first. Let's pray that together. Father, in this quiet space right now, we, uh, we just want to acknowledge how incredible you are. You are an extraordinary God. 
Father, as individuals, there's things that we can highlight this year where we can see your great work in our life and we praise you and we honour you for all of that. Father, thank you for the way in which you've been involved in the life of this church as well too. We see that expressed in our different ministries and uh, the, uh, the different things that have happened this year. We thank you that if we've pushed online, you have provided for us with that. We thank you in our community care and our engagement there that, uh, God, we, we just continue to keep functioning there. And we've been a strong presence right here in the heart of this city, bringing community and a sense of joy and hope. Father God, we uh, want to just thank you for our partners again today. Thank you for what you're doing in their lives. Father, thank you for each life that's represented uh, right here in Bendigo and well beyond. That as we've come before you today, Lord, you know our lives so intimately. And so we offer up our lives before you again today. And we pray that you would just be at work in them. And that we pray that your spirit would continue to keep doing a fresh and a new work. Because we don't want to just know about your son in our heads. We want to continue to experience all of his grace and mercy deep within our hearts as well. And Father, we bring you gifts today and we offer them up to you as an act of worship and we, uh, we honour you with that. We bless you and we adore you for all that you have done. And we ask, Father, that you would continue to uh, enable the light of this church to keep shining brightly. Not only into this community, but into the, uh, uh, the deepest parts of this globe as well. And Lord, as we open up your word today. We are just so grateful for Pastor Dave. We thank you for the word that he has been thinking through and for what, the way in which he's going to share today. We thank you that your spirit is already moving in the hearts of people. And so we look forward today to this word. We pray that you would speak deeply to us. Lord, may there be a real anointing upon that word that goes out. And we pray that today in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning to you all. Thank you, Dave. If you've got your Bibles, I want to encourage you to open them up. Uh, if you haven't, take the time to go and get hold of them, uh, because we're going to be digging into uh, a part of God's Word this morning, John chapter 4 and verses 1 to 42, and there's a, it's a little chunk of narrative, and it'll be good for you to be able to follow along uh, with me as we go through it. So take the time to go and grab your Bibles, and uh, we can dig into it together this morning. As you, as you get uh, those Bibles out and you, and you find John chapter 4, um, I want to um, just encourage you, as you or set your mind uh, in some sort of context as we come to this passage. And I want you to listen to this and to read this uh, as a conversation between two people. Uh, two people where, where one is ready for the conversation and, and is controlling the conversation a bit, you'll see, and where the other one has just stumbled into it and they're not quite sure uh, where it's going. Can you, can you imagine that with me in your mind? Uh, I, just to help you, I have a, I have a colleague, Leighton, who I've been working with now uh, here at uh, Bendigo Baptist Church for 10 years. And um, Leighton is, uh, well, there's been a number of conversations I've had with Leighton over time. It might be me sitting in my office and um, just doing something there or wandering down the corridor. And I just happen to run into Leighton. And there'll often be a little glint in his eye. And, um, and he'll start to say something. And as he starts to ask me a question, maybe it's an opportunity that he's got for me. Or maybe it's uh, something else. Have you thought about this? I suddenly become aware that the conversation is heading somewhere. I'm not always quite sure where it's going, and uh, my mind is spinning madly, wondering where he is taking me. Now, you, 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 many of you have experienced those conversations with Leighton, maybe, <laughs> and you, you've enjoyed that experience, or you've been a bit, a bit bewildered like me at times. Some of you will know other conversations you've had like that. Try and be thinking in those terms here as we're in John 4, and, uh, and that will help you. We're going to um, have Antonio read it for us. Uh, here it comes. Uh, read along from verse 7. Thanks, Antonio. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone to town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, 
and I am a Samaritan woman, how can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God who it, and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw uh, with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Uh, Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them uh, will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so, I don't, so that I won't go get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you, are, you have now is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus said, uh, Believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming now yet a time um, yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshippers must worship in the spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one you're speaking to, I am he. Thank you, Antonio. Okay, let's, um, let's dig into this conversation a little bit and into the movement of it. And, and as I said, there is, there is one person, Jesus, in this conversation who, who is there quite intentionally. And the, the few verses that came before verse 7 help us to see that. Jesus is, um, is heading uh, along the road. Uh, they're going, they, verse 3, they leave Judea and they head for Galilee. And verse 4 says he, he had to pass through Samaria. Now, it, it was the simplest way to go geographically, uh, but also it, it's apparent that Jesus meant to be there. And he finds himself there at this well and meeting uh, with this woman in, uh, in verse 7 where we started. And, and as we see there, uh, Jesus initiates the conversation with her. Uh, he, he asks her for a drink. And, um, and we find as we go into the conversation there that, uh, that she is surprised uh, by that and, uh, and they're talking uh, about water. And then as we go through the verses there, uh, we see that um, Jesus starts to lead her to think about uh, living water that deals with thirst forever. And, and she probably thinks that, that Jesus is a, a little bit unhinged at this point in the conversation. She's wondering where he's going, what he's doing. And, um, but like many people, uh, pre, at that time and, and since then, as they've encountered Jesus, she is intrigued by the idea of, of living water. And, and she doesn't realize that if she wants to receive this pure water bubbling up inside her, as Jesus mentions about as they go on along, that she will have to get rid of the moldy, stagnant water she's been living off all this time. And, and in her case, what we find there in the conversation is that moldy, stagnant water was, was the men in her life that she had been relying on. And so we come down to, to verse 16. The conversation ha has moved on. And, um, and she says, verse 15, look, look, give me this water that you're talking about. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sick of coming here to draw water from the well. Uh, she's clearly not quite understanding where Jesus is. And so Jesus says to her, verse 16, um, go, call your husband and come here. 
he, uh, he brings in the husband word. And uh, just, just think about what's happening in, in her mind for a moment. She's come to this world. She's, she's met this stranger that she's never come across before. She's having this somewhat random conversation. And then next minute, he speaks to her about something that deeply affects her life. And she has no idea how he comes to know this, why he's saying it. But I can just imagine there is explosions going off in her mind. She's thinking, oh my goodness, what's going on in here? Why is he saying about this? What does he know about me? Can you, you, you might have been in that situation before yourself. And you just, you just got all these questions going around in your mind. That's, that's where she is. And as, she, as they talk, she, she makes the connection that Jesus is a prophet. He's telling truth to her that, that God has, has revealed to him. And, and then we come to, to verse 20. And, um, and in the midst of, of this, this thing that Jesus has suddenly uh, landed her with, and uh, in the midst of a, a mind in turmoil, verse 20, she, uh, she moves things on to a, a religious topic. And uh, perhaps it's a religious topic that she thinks they're going to be able to have an argument about. She's a Samaritan, he's a Jew, and this is the sort of topic that uh, there would have been countless arguments about over time. I need to give you uh, a bit of background for that, really. We go back, way back into the Old Testament, and when the Assyrians captured Samaria, the, the northern kingdom of Israel, in uh, about 720 BC, 721 BC, historians say, they, the Assyrians loved to do a bit of racial mixing with, um, with countries they invaded. And uh, we might have more refined terms for it now, but that's basically what they were doing. They wanted to racially mix up these countries so that they would lose their identity uh, completely. And so what they did was they took a whole lot of the best Israelites uh, back to Assyria, and then they imported a whole lot of foreigners from other nations that they inv had invaded everywhere. And they, um, they brought them into uh, the northern kingdom. And they encouraged them or made the, the opportunity for them to then live amongst the, the remaining Israelites there to, uh, to intermarry with them. And, and in so doing, their Israeliteness was completely compromised they, they were viewed as some sort of of half breed if um if you can um hear that and then after the exile in babylon for the southern kingdom the jews returning to their to their homeland viewed these samaritans up in the north as uh, as racial half breeds with a tainted religion and they wanted nothing to do with them and so they kept themselves apart from the Samaritans. We're still back in Old Testament territory here. And, and so somewhere around about 400 BC, the Samaritans up there built a, a rival temple on Mount Gerizim. And they said, this is the place to worship God. Of course, the, the Jews knew the only place to worship God was in the temple in Jerusalem. And they, and they said that, and they held that very strongly and very closely. But the Samaritans said, no, 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 we've got the temple, the place to worship God on Mount Gerizim. And of course, that fueled all sorts of animosity between the Jews and the Samaritans. And it continued on quite happily into Jesus' day. And you know, many people suggest that, that some Jews... Uh, to avoid the prospect of walking through Samaria, uh, which was the best route from Jerusalem to Jericho, they would go, they would go around, and, and it seems that was the case. Jesus decided he was going to go through Samaria. But this woman, as they're in the middle of this conversation, and she's frantically trying to get, a, get Jesus off this topic of her own troubled personal life, she says, oh, let's talk about worship here, and let's have an argument, hopefully, I'm guessing she's thinking. But... What she didn't say, and what was also sitting in the background there, was that the Old Testament prophets had promised a day when Jews and Samaritans would be brought together under one king. And you, you go to places like Ezekiel chapter 37, 
verses 15 to 28. And you see that it's important background for, for what we're seeing here in John. You see, as Jesus speaks here in chapter 4, he's giving us echoes of Ezekiel 37 to point us to the fact that he fulfills the prophecy and, um, and he is the promised king that is spoken of in Ezekiel. And, um, and so she tries to drag him off into, that, into this conversation about worship. But, but where it ends up, in verse 26, as, uh, as the conversation continues on, is that uh, she says in verse 25, oh, look, <laughs> she's probably realizing she's way out of her depth here in this conversation. And, um, and as a bit of a, oh, well, you know, this will sort it all out. I know that the Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Whew. Hopefully we can put this to bed. <laughs> this conversation's hard work for me. And Jesus says, verse 26, I who speak to you am he. Jesus says it plainly that, that he is the Messiah, that this prophecy is spoken of, that she has been talking about, that the Samaritan is talking about, that everybody is looking for. And so there, you see the way the conversation moves as, uh, as we go through those verses. I guess another way of looking at the movement of verses 7 through to 26 there is that we see it's a progression of understanding about Jesus. As Jesus has the conversation with this woman and they move through the different topics, it's a, it, she comes to understand more and more about Jesus. Uh, you can go back to... Um, uh, the first part there, verses 7 through to um, uh, verse 15, and, uh, and Jesus reveals himself to be living water. Uh, he uses those words uh, as, we, as we go through. And um, uh, whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him, him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. That's verse 13 and 14. And, and, and Jesus uses these words, I guess, because it resonates with uh, another passage from Ezekiel, chapter 47, verses 1 through to 12. And this passage in Ezekiel speaks of, of living water flowing out from the temple after God's glory returns to the temple. And Jesus is helping her to understand that, that here is something that has been spoken of in the past and that she can see it in him. You go to places like Isaiah 44 and 45, 55 as well. And there's also a picture there of God pouring out his spirit in the day of salvation. And what we, what we see here as we, as we think about Jesus being living water is that, um, that living water, Jesus is a gift of God. We see that God's living water quenches the thirst of our heart and our soul. And we see that it continues to produce life. All that is there in verses 13 and 14. There is a gift. It is thirst quenching and it continues to produce life as it goes on. And so Jesus shows us that he is living water. But then he, then he goes on in verses 16 to 19. And um, in the, I guess in the movement of the conversation, we see that, that Jesus is revealed to be a prophet. One who, is, who has been sent by God to, uh, to speak God's words to people so that they will understand God, so that they will know who he is and, and what he's about. And Jesus comes to bring the words of God about himself to this woman. He, he, he shows himself to be a prophet. And then in verses 20 to 26, as we progress in our understanding of, uh, of Jesus, we see that he is a, he is a Messiah or a saviour to be worshipped. And, um, and he describes himself, look, it, it, it's not about where you'll be worshipping. It's not about a place. He, he makes it plain to her that, um, that the hour is coming. That's really interesting here, this, this word hour. Um, I, I can't claim this is my own revelation. I read it in one of the commentaries this week. But um, that word hour is only used in John in relation to Jesus dying on the cross. You go and have a look if you want. But, uh, but Jesus only uses the word hour in relation to him dying on the cross. So in other words, he says, as, as I die on the cross and, and I rise again, that's the time when there will be no worshipping in, in the temple in Jerusalem or the temple that was on Mount Gerizim. The worship will happen in me. 
God's promised Messiah. It'll be about a person, not a place. And so as we go through the conversation, we have this progression of understanding about Jesus. And I, I think we need to understand as we think about that, that that's the big theology of the passage here where Jesus finishes. Jesus is the saviour of the world, the great thirst quencher who brings spiritual life to all who worship him. And, and that is, that is the, I guess, some summary of the gospel message, the good news that we have in Jesus Christ. That is some summary of the message that Jesus wants to bring to the world then, to her and to us now, to, to embrace and to believe. But I want us to, I want us to think about um, this idea of extraordinary uh, a little bit. And you may... Um, I want to take you to, uh, to look at this woman through that lens of extraordinary. And firstly, I, I, want to, I want us to understand that what we have here is an ordinary woman in an extraordinary story. An ordinary woman in an extraordinary story. I, I want us to highlight, firstly, how she's ordinary. And um, uh, you uh, have a picture there on your screen of, of something that has become quite ordinary for us now, uh, over time through COVID, uh, wearing face masks. As we go around living in Victoria, um, it, uh, it has become an ordinary sight to see people wearing face masks. And, and what do we see about this woman uh, that is ordinary? Well, uh, we see that firstly that she's unnamed. As we, as we come into the passage, verse 7, uh, a woman from Samaria. She doesn't have a name. Um, and, um, and maybe there's a contrast to Nicodemus here from chapter 3. Uh, Nicodemus, we, we know his name. Uh, this woman is, is unnamed. Uh, there, there's other contrasts that commentators bring out from Nicodemus that are, that are interesting for us. Nicodemus was learned. He was powerful. He was respected. She here, she's unschooled. She, she has no influence where she is, it seems. She's despised. He was a man. He, he was a Jew. He, he was a ruler amongst the Pharisees. Uh, she's a woman. She's a Samaritan. And she's a moral outcast. But she, she's an unknown woman of, of Samaria. Uh, she's also ordinary in, in the sense that she cares what people think about her. She, she comes out to the well, and it seems that she comes out uh, in, the, in the middle of the day. Now, um, now, now, that is surprising to people who know, because the water collecting would have been taking place in the, in the morning or, or in the evening, in the cooler parts of the day. That's when most people would have been collecting their water. She goes out there in the middle of the day, and we can only assume that she goes out there because she doesn't want to meet people. She, she's viewed by people as an outcast, and she wants to keep away from them. She doesn't want to hear them gossiping about her. She doesn't want to have awkward questions. She doesn't want to have them, have them giving her uh, sly, uh, sly looks out of the side of their, their, their eyes and, and sniggering at her. And, um, and so she is ordinary in, um, in that sense, and we see that she comes with... Uh, I guess, dark secrets to hide in the midst of the conversation with Jesus. It's evident that there's things in her past that she wants left back there. And, um, and that is, that is where, where she's at. And the fourth reason I see her as ordinary here is that she is keen to talk distractions rather than deal with difficult subjects. Uh, Jesus is, is pointing the finger there and, um, and challenging her uh, about uh, what's going on with the men in her life or the men that have been in her life. Uh, and a paraphrase of, uh, of the movement from, um, from verse 19 to verse 20 uh, uh, could be simply this. Jesus, while we're on the subject of my adultery, what, what do you think about where we should worship? <laughs> do you hear that? Let's just get off this as quickly as we can. Uh, my kids do it all the time. Uh, you know, I'll say to the one of them, look, um, can you do this? Or I don't like that you have done this. Why have you done that? And what's the response that often comes? Oh, well, look what the other one's done. <laughs> let's, let's get this off me as quickly as possible. I want to go somewhere else, and that's what she's doing. And, you know, she's ordinary like us in, in the sense that people do this spiritually all the time too. They, they find themselves uh, in challenging conversations, perhaps. They find themselves being confronted with things they don't really want to think about or talk about. 
and, uh, and then move it on. You know, maybe it, it could be something like this. Somebody's talking to somebody else and they say, you know, Jesus really died for you and he wants to have a relationship with you. That might be the conversation. And, and this would have been repeated many, many times. And what will the response be? Well, what about the people in the jungle tribes of the Amazon that have never heard about him? Well, it's got nothing to do with the fact that Jesus died for that person in front of me. We, we do this sort of spiritual movement um, to try and distract. And, and I guess I'm highlighting this woman's ordinariness. I, I think that's a word. <laughs> I'm assuming it is. I heard, um, I heard the, the, the senior researcher at the National Dictionary Centre of Australia this week. <laughs> what a title. I heard him saying that we only use about 100 to 200 words in our everyday language. And um, I'm trying to add another one in ordinariness. Uh, I won't use that very much again, but here it is today. Now, I want to highlight her ordinariness to help us make the connection to our story with ourselves, to, to help us understand that this could be any of us. It, you know, we're not back in Samaria, but we're in the same sort of situation as this woman. We have all sorts of things in our past that we're very keen to leave there. We have all sorts of distractions that we want to bring in when things get uncomfortable and difficult for us in life. Uh, we, we care what people think about us. And, um, and, and for many of us, we may think that we're just some unnamed blip in the universe that nobody will miss or care about at all when, when time goes on. And so we find ourselves identifying with her ordinariness. These are common things for humanity. But I also want to say that this ordinariness, this ordinary, finds itself in the middle of an extraordinary story. And I've uh, given you a picture there of, um, of a coloured umbrella in the midst of a whole lot of black umbrellas. And I hope that helps you stick in your mind that, that what we see here in Jesus dealing with this woman is extraordinary. The first thing I want us to see is that, is that Jesus upends social conventions to talk to her. You get that sense there in verse, in verse 8. Um, well, I... I that, that Jesus goes through Samaria. That's a surprise. Um, uh, and then uh, verse 8, um, oh, sorry, verse 9, Jesus asks her for a drink in verse 7, and, um, and she says, surprised, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? There's two things going on there. A Jew is asking a Samaritan for something, and a man is asking a woman for something. Two social conventions that Jesus had just tipped upside down in, in one question. And he, and he goes and upends these conventions to talk to her. It, it would have been scandalous in some way that Jesus is allowing himself to be there at the well or on his own. The disciples come back later in the chapter. I've forgotten what verse it is, but you'll find it. And they say, what's going on? Uh, have you... Have you just been talking to her? And they're surprised that he's been there talking to her. And, um, and so Jesus upends social conventions to talk to her. And wonderfully, Jesus is still in the business of upending social conventions. Over and over again, he, he breaks into our world, he breaks into our situations and into our lives, and, and we need not fear that he is going to, you know, tread with the conventions that we are bound by or that our society is bound by. Jesus loves to break in and upend social conventions that we may be confronted with the reality of who he is. We see also uh, that uh, this story is extraordinary because Jesus delivers the bombshell that worship is all about a person. It's not about a place. And that's still the case today. Nothing has changed there. Back then, they were arguing about which temple it was going to be in. I, I, I want to say that, that probably that's still the case for many people today. They, they, they want to identify worship with, with a place. They want to identify worship with belonging to a particular church denomination um, and all sorts of different things. Plenty of people outside of, um, of Jesus want to identify worship with perhaps a particular statue or a particular a particular thing. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. Worship is all about me. It's about me because I am the Messiah, the King that's been promised. I am all that God has, all of God's promises wrapped up together. I am access to God. And in that then, I am what you worship. And I think... Um, I just want to say to us that, uh, that, that perhaps COVID 
has given an opportunity for that to be reinforced for us. You know, we, we find ourselves uh, spread apart physically much more than we have been in the past. And, um, and, and Jesus comes to us and says, look, worship is still about me. Let's not get hung up about it being a certain place. Uh, we find true worship uh, in Jesus Christ. And then thirdly, I want us to see here that it's extraordinary because Jesus helps her see that he is the lasting thirst quencher that she's been looking for. Jesus didn't bring up the husband issue in, uh, in verse 16 there just to have a cheap shot at her and make her feel bad or even to condemn her. He did it so she might see that it's her heart that is really thirsty. We're not told the details. We're not told whether it's her moving on from these relationships or whether it's men that have been using her. But five husbands and one current partner tells us she's got a great thirst in her life and she's seeking to have that satisfied by relationship. She is desperately trying to fill up the emptiness and the pain by moving from one man to the next. But that's never going to deal with the spiritual thirst of her soul. And Jesus needs to open her eyes to see herself clearly and I I guess I just want to say to us there are spiritually thirsty people all around us they just don't know it or they don't want to know it and there are all sorts of different ways in which people seek to quench their thirst it might be it might be their career it might be the things they have it it, it might be uh, other people in their lives it might be the way people view them it might be their social media presence i don't know there's a, there's there's dozens and dozens of different ways in which we seek to have our, our thirst quenched uh, but i can let, let's make that issue a bit more personal though what are you chasing after you see the thirsty the the thirsty people are not just around us the thirsty people are us it's us and we've got to ask ourselves what are we chasing after what are we using as a substitute for our own spiritual thirst and the reality for us is as we're part of of god's people the church we, we know it can be satisfied in jesus christ we don't have the excuse of ignorance. We know. And yet we will still find ourselves pushing off to have our thirst satisfied in other directions. And Jesus says to us this morning, will you allow your heart to be gripped away from being captivated by these other things and be captivated by me? And that's fourthly where I want to take us in this extraordinary is that this woman, in the midst of her thirst, she allows herself to be confronted by Jesus and believe. Have a look at verse 28 and verse 29 as we, uh, as we finish there. She, sa- she says as, um, as she goes off, So the woman left her water jar. She went away into town. She said to the people, Come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and they were coming to him. It's no, it's no small thing. It's one thing to be confronted. It's another thing to be so affected that we believe and do something about it. And uh, and that's what she does. And what happens as we read on is that it brings extraordinary change in her life and the lives of people around her. Have a look at verses 39 to 42. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. She was, a, she was a social outcast. And now suddenly she goes into town and people listen to her and believe her. And then we see that they come out to listen for Jesus themselves. And verse 41, and many more believe because of his word. They said to the woman, verse 42, it's no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves and we know that this is indeed the saviour of the world. Jesus loves to bring extraordinary change in our lives and the lives of people around us. You know, we, we, we constantly are hearing about ways to change our life change your life there's ideas everywhere Uh, recently i saw a a youtube video that emma was watching that just made me laugh the title was 20 things on amazon you didn't know you wanted that will change your life (laughs) 
<laughs> and I just laugh at that. Shopping on Amazon won't change your life. It'll lower your bank balance, but it won't change your life. Uh, I was listening to Tim Keller this week uh, on this, and uh, he had some great insights, and, uh, and I'll, I'll dig into them as we uh, are on Digging Deeper on, on Monday on, on our Facebook page at Bendigo Baptist Church. You'll find a little Digging Deeper thing where we seek to, to dig in a bit more. But, but what we need to be understanding here is that real change only comes when our heart is affected and moved affected and moved away from our self-focus that's what Jesus wants to understand us to understand today and so as we finish I guess I want to leave you with this question and it's the question that Jesus confronts this woman with and, and confronts us this morning as we as we consider this passage and here it is will you allow yourself to be confronted by Jesus and have your heart so captivated that he is satisfying your thirst and is the object of your worship satisfying your thirst and the object of your worship captivating your heart and I want to say for you for your encouragement as that happens God will love to bring people around you God does love to bring people around you to believe in him for themselves let's pray and, uh, and ask God to help us. Father, we thank you this morning uh, for this story. It, it's, it, it's extraordinary the way this woman uh, meets with Jesus, the territory that they wander through, and, and how she comes to allow herself to be confronted, to be captivated, to have her heart changed, to believe, and to go and tell others in such a way that, that many others come to believe in Jesus too. And, and God, we pray that you would continue to be doing that work amongst us by your Holy Spirit. We thank you for this living water, your spirit that dwells in us as your people. And I pray that you would give us an ongoing thirst day by day and give us such a thirst for you that we allow ourselves to be confronted and captivated and that uh, the extraordinary change that results helps many, many others come to believe and to follow Jesus for themselves. Father, we, we ask this. We know that you love to do this work. And we pray that you'd be doing it in us and through us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing together.
Amen. That is our, uh, our prayer this morning, as God captivates our heart, that it would uh, burn in us in such a way that it affects the people around us. Thank you for being with us this morning. If you want to uh, connect into um, Bendigo Baptist Church and, and find out more about it, connect at bendigobaptist.org. .au. We'd love to be able to help you out. If you want to pray with somebody, just put pray in the comments there on Facebook. And um, we'd love to, there are people there waiting to pray with you. Thank you. God bless you as you go.